Good evening, everyone. My name is Corey Kimson, Ward 3 Councillor, Acting Chair of this Council meeting. Our last Council meeting was March 19th, 2024, and since then, Council has held four closed meetings on March 26th, April 2nd, April 8th, and April 11th, 2024, related to confidential HR matters, a confidential HR presentation, and a training and education workshop for Council. Before continuing, we will now rise from closed session. Councillor Earnshaw, you have the motion to rise. Please read it in its entirety. Thank you, Chair Kempson. It's moved by me and seconded by Councillor Schwery that the Council rise from the closed sessions held on March 26th, April 2nd, April 8th, and April 11th, 2024, and reconvene in open session at 7.01 p.m. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any questions? Does Council have any comments? I will ask our clerk to display voting for members. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that carries unanimously. I'd like to note that the City of Cambridge Council meetings are broadcast on the City's YouTube page and archived on the City's website. It is imperative that we, as City Council, promote public participation using a variety of methods, including YouTube. On that note, our last Council meeting had 780 views on YouTube and 14 delegations. I would like to point out that we have rules of engagement during council meetings. I ask that you please be respectful while others are speaking, refrain from any demonstrations, and I encourage you to actively listen to others. For staff and delegates alike, please be sure that you stand six to eight inches from the microphone at the presenter's podium for optimal sound quality. And if you are taller or shorter, you can adjust it up and down yourself. In the event of an emergency, please evacuate council chambers using the nearest exit staircase. If you require assistance, please see our clerk staff as they will provide you with the support to exit the facility. Once you have evacuated the building, please gather outside of City Hall in the Farmer's Market parking lot and await further instructions. It is my pleasure to introduce Council. Councillor Schwery. Councillor Devine sends his regrets. Councillor Earnshaw. Councillor Roberts. Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Cooper. Councillor Ermetta, and Mayor Leggett sends her regrets. A special thanks to our clerks and technology services staff who are assisting with logistics for this meeting. We will now sing the national anthem. If you are able, please rise and follow along.
We embrace our shared responsi responsibility with the Indigenous peoples to take care of this earth and its creatures. We can only do so by walking the path as partners stewarding this land as we have been given the duty together to live in balance and harmony with all living things. We acknowledge and respect the Indigenous peoples who came before us and who we live amongst. By honouring this truth of past and present, may we come to true reconciliation through listening, reflecting and learning. A reminder to members of Council that the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act requires Council members to declare any direct or indirect pecuniary interest in relation to a matter under consideration. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, we will move forward with this meeting. Our first item for consideration is the consent agenda. For members of the public, please note that the online version of Report 24-022-CRS Water Main CIPP Rehabilitation Holiday Inn Drive was missing the table on page 207 of the meeting agenda. The matter was brought to our attention and was fixed earlier this afternoon. Councillor Roberts, you have the motion. Please read it in its entirety. Thank you, um, Councillor Kimson. Moved by myself, seconded by uh, Councillor Ermetta. Recommendation that all items listed under the heading of consent agenda for April 16th, 2024 be adopted as recommended. 7.1, Council Meeting Minutes, March 19th, 2024. 7.2, Council Workshop Meeting Minutes, March 21st, 2024. 7.3, Statutory Public Meeting Minutes, April 2nd, 2024. 7.4, Council Information Package, March 22nd, 2024. 7.5, 24-003-CRS, Asset Retirement Obligation and Contaminated Sites Policies. 7.6, 24-004-IFS, 2023 Drinking Water System Performance Report. 7.6, 24-022-CRS, Water Main CIPP Rehabilitation Holiday and Drive. 7.8, 24-062-CD, 49 Queen Street East, Assignment of Tax Increment Grant, TIG. 7.9, 24-004, Planning Bylaw Memo, Part Lot Control Exemption, Part of Block 191, 58M-684. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Does any council member have any comments on an item on the consent agenda? I would just like to make one comment with regard to the report 24-004-IFS, the 2023 Drinking Water System Performance Report. And I would like to commend staff um, with the incredible marks that we received. The 2023-24 Cambridge Drinking Water System Inspection was completed by the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks in February 2024, resulting in zero opportunities for improvement and zero non-conformances for an overall score of 100%. And I'd just like to thank our staff who do such a great job of keeping our drinking water system in fine working order. So thank you very much for that great score. I will ask our clerk to display voting for members. Starting voting. And closing voting. And the consent, consent agenda carries unanimously. We will now move on to consideration of reports. A note for our audience before we continue, report 24-065-CD, City Hall Campus Market Square Placemaking Project has been pulled and will come forward at a later date. Our first report is item 8.1.1, .1, report 24-011-CRS, Citizen Appointments to Advisory Committees. Council met and reviewed applications for citizen advisory committees in closed session on March 19th, 2024. Councillor Earnshaw, you have the motion. Can you please read it out in its entirety? Thank you, Chair Kimson. It's moved by me and seconded by Councillor Hamilton. That report 24-011-CRS, citizen appointments to advisory committees be received. And that confidential appendices C, 
D, E, F, G, and H to report 24-011-CRS be received and remain confidential. And that the following individual be appointed to the Arthur White Sports Bursary Fund Advisory Committee as a voting member for the term of council ending November 14, 2026, Carl Herod. And that the following individual be appointed to the Committee of Adjustment as an alternate committee member for the term of council ending November 14, 2026, Trevor McWilliams. And that the following individuals be appointed to the Cultural Awards Advisory Committee for the term of council ending November 14, 2026, Ashlyn Gladman, David Campbell, and Fazia Khan as voting committee members, and Shelley Aki as an alternate committee member. And that the following individual be appointed to the Environmental Advisory Committee as an alternate committee member for the term of council ending November 14, 2026, David Campbell. And that the following individuals be appointed to the Municipal Heritage Advisory Committee as voting members for the term of council ending November 14, 2026, Christina Thompson and Mark Mello. And that the city clerk be directed to notify all successful and unsuccessful applicants. And further, that council appointed citizen members to the city's advisory committees who do not submit their signed code of conduct form within the first month after their appointment has been made shall forfeit their membership on the committee to which they have been appointed. Thank you, Councillor Earnshaw. Are there any questions? Does any member of council have any comments? Seeing none, I'll ask our clerk to call for the vote. Starting voting. In closing voting. And that carries unanimously. Our next report is item 8.1.2, report 24-012-CRS, Cambridge Fire Department Annual Report 2023. We have a presentation from Chief Ralph Martin. Welcome, Chief Martin. Good evening, uh, Chair Kimson and members of council. It is my distinct honor to provide a quick highlight presentation regarding the Cambridge Fire Department annual report. The accomplishments and achievements outlined in the report are based on a collaborative effort of an entire team as identified in this organizational chart. Each member of our team has exceeded expectations throughout the year. For context, I've added this slide to identify for members of council which fire stations are reflective of your wards. Although the fire districts are not divided exactly on ward boundaries, this gives you a general idea of which fire stations service your ward. Our first line of defense is our fire and life safety team. This team is made up of two enthusiastic and passionate firefighters who provided 2,106 educational sessions and created all of our social media content, which reached a total of almost 694,000 people. Our second line of defense is our fire prevention team. This team is, this is the team that conducts inspections to help keep our homes and businesses fire safe. They conduct investigations to determine origin and cause and to help prevent reoccurrences. In total, they completed 873 inspections and 673 activities, such as fire safety plans, site plans, and fire investigations. An item of note, vulnerable occupancies, such as retirement homes and assisted living residents are mandata mandated by law to have annual inspections. These inspections can often take multiple days to complete. Due to the size and complexity of buildings, in Cambridge, we have 26 uh, such buildings that are classified of, as vulnerable occupancies. This is a significant number for a city our size. As a comparison, the city I previously worked has 36. It's a substantial undertaking to meet our compliance requirements, and I'm proud to say we were 100% compliant. 
Our last line of defense is our emergency response division, often referred to as suppression division, but we are an all hazards department. The demand for service increased significantly in 2023 to, uh, by about 22%. Contributing factors for this increase are an increase in outdoor fires, rescue calls, and medical calls. Oh, I guess I better move along. The skills and expertise of our firefighters would not be possible without the ongoing efforts of our training division. As highlighted, each firefighter receives 200 hours of training each year, and we continue to work towards the provincial mandate of the certification deadline in 2026. For those of you who like stats, that's approximately 27,000 hours of training delivered by a very dedicated team. With the ongoing concerns around climate change and the impact it's having on emergency response and disaster preparedness, it is important that we look for ways to do our part. Our mechanical division reviewed and researched best practices to identify a new technology that could benefit CFD. Idle reduction technology allows our apparatus to be fully functional on scenes without requiring them to idle and burn fuel. This is a significant health benefit to those working on scenes and around apparatus. Also, as battery technology has improved, this team has evaluated uh, battery operated extrication tools and we have begun the transition to phase out gas engines that power our hydraulic tools. We also oversee emergency management, emergency management division. Aside from our fire specific legislative requirements, this division has many government mandated obligations. Our team continues to meet our requirements while also providing value added services such as active threat preparations and continuity of operations planning. My last highlight is something that I feel is the most unique about CFD and gives me a great amount of pride to share. In 2023, firefighters volunteered over 660 hours of their time to charitable events. Most notably is the Basket Fund. This program has been running for 102 years straight. And in 2023, the program supported and fed over 400 families. While the Basket Fund is a yearly program, they also jump in and volunteer when a need arises that is unplanned recently coming together to assist in a refresh training at Innis Free House. As I conclude, I want to thank our fire leadership team and the administration team for their leadership and support. They work hard to ensure that day-to-day -day operations continue to provide a valuable service to the community of Cambridge. I'm happy to take any questions now or after you've re reviewed the full report, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much, Chief Martin, for your presentation. Are there any questions from members of council? Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chair Kimson, and thank you, Chief, for your presentation and for all the hard work that you folks do every single day to keep us all safe. Um, I just have a question. I noticed you mentioned that we have a couple of hybrid technology fire trucks, and I know that I've seen, you know, these videos of hybrid vehicles on fire and that they're managed differently. Can you maybe speak to some of the technology that we have here to manage the new EV? Like if we were to have an EV, fire, obviously not one of our fire trucks, but if another vehicle that was an electric vehicle were to have a fire, how is that managed differently? And do we have the, the proper technology to manage that? Uh, thank you through the chair. Uh, it's a challenge that we're working on. Um, it's a, an evolving um technology in terms of uh, battery and uh, the uh, the energy sources. Right now, uh, the uh, strategies are copious amounts of water. So we would, uh, for an electric vehicle fire, we would send numerous vehicles that carry the water. Plus we have obviously the hydrants that we can connect to. Um, there are a number of other um, possibilities that we can deploy. There's uh, fire blankets that, that are being tested and evaluated, but it truly is an emerging, emerging technology that is um, challenging the fire service right now. So I think it's one of those things that we're gonna continue to work on and, and to evaluate the, the solutions as they come forward. Thank you so much. 
Councillor Hamilton. Thank you, Councillor Kimson, through you. And thank you very much for your presentation, Chief, and for all the work uh, that you and your team do. Uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is just a small question, but on page 278, you mentioned that there are uh, the school outreach, and I think there's a picture of it up there. Uh, here, 40 people participated. Uh, I was just wondering if you could clarify the 40 people that participated in school outreach. Would that be 40 schools? Or, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yes, it would be 40 schools. So through, sorry, through the chair, it would be 40 schools that would okay. have participated, yes. And may I uh, just clarify, the what um, age of students are you reaching? Is it everything from kindergarten to grade eight? or uh, They typically will um, target, I, I believe that they target grades uh, one through four, like a, sort of specifically, and then they would, um, the, the following years, then they, they select a different set of classes. So they're not uh, seeing... All the, like every class is not being met or, or uh, taught in all the same year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you. I think that's obviously essential um, to teach students about the importance of fire safety. And uh, one follow-up question, if I may. Thank you. And this goes back to page 263. Um, just as the emergency calls for service increased by 22% uh, over the past year, can you summarize what explains that? 22% increase where it's concentrated in the city? Uh, through the chair, so concentrate where the call volume or where the 22% came from geographically or the type of call? Uh, I guess the type of call, like whether or not it's concentrated in the core or in the outskirts. So we had a an approximate 30% increase in our um, uh, structure fire, property fires, that kind of uh, like fire aspect. So I would say the majority of those came from that. We also have outdoor fires. Uh, about 5% of the 22% increase came from outdoor fires, like an increase there. Um, and then the other um, percentages would come from rescue calls. We had more uh, river rescue, water rescue type calls, as well as um, MBCs and medicals. Thank you. Councillor Strary. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and thanks, Chief, for your presentation. Um, on page uh, 274, where uh, it was talking about the fire suppression, and there was a total call volume of uh, over 9,000, sorry. The third highest was the false calls. And I was just wondering if there's, if you can sign up, summarize, were they malicious, were there errors? And then going forward is, uh, perhaps more education or how we can reduce those uh, false calls. Yeah, through the chairs. So false calls um, might be a little bit of a, it, it's how our, our fire marshal <clears throat> pardon me, categorizes them, but they are alarm ringings. So they could, that could be um, a pot on the stove, a burnt, uh, burnt toast. That could also be, um, you know, a child pulls a pull station, or that could be some sort of a mechanical uh, error in an alarm system. Um, so it's rarely that that would be uh, in a residential home. That's typically in a a, a residence that has a or a, an apartment building or a building that would have an alarm system. Um, in terms of reducing those calls, it comes back to education, um, whether it be, you know, from a cooking standpoint, from a, you know, watch what you heat type uh, campaign, things like that. Um, it is uh, obviously a, a strain on the resources, but a lot of times, you know, so if we measure those calls when those alarms come in, um, there are times when that alarm is, you know, we might think it's a false alarm, but it actually turns out to be something significant. So we don't want to just not go to those types of calls. Thank you, Chief. Councillor Cooper. Yes, thank you, Chair Kimson. Yeah, thanks for your presentation, Chief. Um, actually, on the uh, on the same uh, page here, I've got similar questions. Um, well, first of all, the 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 year end call is. Um, I mean, we've more than doubled over the past, uh, well, from 2020 to 2023. Um, I noticed two of them that were responsible for that is uh, line seven and eight. We've got medical resuscitation calls. Um, gone up from 2202 in 2020 to uh, almost 5,800. And also the other response just below it, up from 266 
to 1137. Um, this obviously accounts for a lot of this uh, year-end volume toll. It's increased significantly. Can you give some um, details as to what speci uh, specifically what that's uh, talking to? What's increased? Uh, yeah. it's 274. Thank you. Through the chair, uh, the the increase in medical calls is um, partly due to you know uh, an increase in population, um, but I do think that there seems to be a, um, more of a trend uh, across the emergency services as a whole that uh, call volumes are going up for e for the EMS, paramedics, police, fire. All of us are are receiving much higher so from the nine one one calls to nine one one. So it could be a societal trend, but I think what the other aspect that we're looking at is. Um, in terms of uh, post-COVID, you know, coming out of COVID, coming out of um, uh, lockdowns, that kind of thing, I think the, there was a little bit more re the responses in terms of, uh, I don't know, I guess people are, are more fearful, they're more reactive, they're more responsive. So then they're that's driving up some of the calls to 911. These are some of the discussions that we're having uh, just as, as chiefs. And um, in terms of other response, uh, that would categorize our uh, outdoor fires that I had mentioned earlier. Um, so that would, the, the increase there has a lot more to do with the 5% uh, the increase of our, from our outdoor, outdoor fires. Okay, thank you. Councillor Renshaw. Thank you, Chair Kimson. Uh, thank you, Chief Martin. Um, this follows on uh, questions that were asked by uh, other councillors, uh, particularly Councillor Roberts asking about electrical vehicle fires um, and uh, Councillor Squarey's question that led to you speaking of educational efforts to try to minimize uh, fire incidences, um, all of which is by way of preamble to my recollection that there was a pretty serious fire on Beverly Street that resulted, as I understood it, from an electrical uh, assisted bike that was inside the premises of the owner of the bike and mm -hmm. caused a fire. So I, I have two questions arising from that. One is, is there any new or different uh, uh, training or educational program that is designed to uh, alert the public to the possibility of electrical fires arising from faulty bicycle batteries and suggesting that they not be kept indoors. Um, and the other is uh, when such a fire unfortunately occurs, is there any difference in the, you mentioned lots of water and blankets and stuff, but is there any other difference in the way that they're approached? Are they harder to put out? Are they more difficult to address in some way? Those are my two questions, thanks. Thank you for your question and through the chair. Uh, so the, the first question in terms of education, um, there absolutely are tactics and strategies that the fire marshal and the fire service in, as a whole are working on to spread the word about the dangers of uh, electric vehicles, where to store them, how to charge them. You know, in a lot of uh, ways, people will plug different chargers in. And, you know, I'm guilty sometimes of grabbing a charger from my phone that maybe wasn't from the manufacturer. And so there are campaigns out there to try and educate people about the dangers of lithium ion batteries um, and proper storage and overheating and those types of things. Um, and to the second question, uh, the they are definitely a lot more challenging. They they're self fueling, if you will. So they um, it, it's not necessarily something that we can you know use our normal strategies of of extinguishment. The amount of water that we would normally put out um, a class A type fire or even a, um, a gasoline or a fuel type fire. You know we need you know fifty to a hundred times more water to put out that kind of uh, the uh, the lithium ion battery uh, fire. So it's it really is a tactic right now is uh, make sure that you have plenty of water. Okay. Councillor Schwery. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, Chief, I have uh, just one more question in regards to the electrical fires. Would those emit some noxious, more noxious substance for breathing and more dangerous than opposed to the others? Thank you, and through the chair, the, um, well, 
I have to tell you, I'm not a scientist, so I don't honestly like uh, don't hold me to this in terms of the, but it it definitely uh, off gases um, very deadly fumes. Um, whether that or not that's more noxious than a regular fire, I couldn't tell you because regular fires are are pretty pollutant as well um, and dangerous. So, but yes, definitely when you uh, when you watch like we've done tests and and put batteries into thermal runaway from a training perspective um, and watch that uh, off gas. It is definitely toxic and and makes the, uh, if it's in an enclosed environment, um, it quickly takes control of that environment and renders it un untenable and uh, very, very unsafe for anybody to enter. Well, interesting. Thank you. Does any other member of council have any questions or comments for Chief Martin? Seeing none, I will ask the clerk, um, sorry, Councillor Emetta, you have the motion. Can you please read it out in its entirety? Well, thank you, um, Chair Corey. Um, so it's moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Cooper, that report 24-012, CRS, Cambridge Fire Department, annual report 2023 be received. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Ameta. Any questions or comments? I'll ask our clerk to call for the vote. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that carries unanimously. Our next report is item number 8.1.3, report 24-032-CRS, appointment of auditor for Grandbridge Corporation for 2024. Councillor Hamilton, you have the motion. Can you please read it out in its entirety? Thank you, Councillor Kempson, and through you, it's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Roberts. The recommendation that report 23-042-CRS, appointment of auditor for Grand Bridge Corporation for 2024 be received. And that the corporation of the city of Cambridge as the shareholder approve the appointment of KPMG as the auditors for Grand Bridge Corporation for the fiscal year 2024. Thank you very much, Councillor Hamilton. Are there any questions? Does council have any comments? Seeing none, I'll ask our clerk to call for the vote. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that carries unanimously. Our next report is item 8.2.1, report 24-003-CRE, 2024-2026 strategic plan approval. We now have a presentation from our Director of Corporate Strategy, Jenna Brown-Jowett. Welcome, Jenna. Thank you. Good evening, council staff and community members. I'm really pleased to be here tonight before you to ask for final approval for our 2024 to 26 strategic plan. Before we get started, I'd like to ask our clerk staff to share a short video and then we'll move into our presentation.
Thank you so much for sharing that. Just a couple of ways that we're investing through people, place, and prosperity in our community. So we wanted to share that. Um, lots of great initiatives and things that are already underway, and we're looking forward to even more of that in the coming years. Okay, so we do have a short presentation this evening um, to, again, look at the journey that we've all been on. Of course, we've been working on this for about a year, and so we're going to take a look back at that journey and how we got here. We're going to talk about our strategy and those key components that you approved in September, and then we're going to look at what comes next in the implementation of this plan. So it's so one thing to build a great plan. It's another thing to bring it to life, and so we're going to share all of the great details about how we plan to do that over the coming years. So in terms of strategic planning, just a, an overview for folks. So it is a blueprint for organization. It's our long-term vision of where we want to go. Very, very important for many reasons for any organization. It helps direct our tax dollars towards the most important priorities for our community. It guides the decisions that we make and the resources that we contribute to our projects and initiatives. And it helps to show progress to our community. It also is really important to bring everyone together aligned in a path forward. You'll probably remember this slide from uh, previous times that I've been here. It's nice to see that we're over on the right-hand side of the screen. We've accomplished so much over the course of the last year. So in terms of the journey that we've gone on, um, all of you have worked really hard. Um, we've had some wonderful engagements from council, from our corporate leadership team, and lots of staff who have helped us along the way. And so if you'll recall, in those early days in phase one, we were really understanding where we were going. Going, right? So it was, what approach are we going to take? We decided a refresh was the right approach rather than starting from scratch with our plan. And we aligned on that path forward and looked at our progress. So what had we achieved uh, so far in that journey? And then as we moved to phase two, we started to do a lot of work in terms of a gap analysis. Where are there tweaks and opportunities with our plan? And how can we really bring this to life in a new way? And so we had lots of great conversations around that and work was done. And then in phase three, we looked at some more concrete pieces around our implementation. So what would a performance management framework look like? How are we going to measure the success of this plan? How are we going to share that with the community? And what does that work start to look like? And really that communication and education um, pieces were the biggest focus. And now we move towards our launch. So in terms of our overall strategy, the image that you have uh, before you and then what you should, uh, for members of council, what you should have there uh, to pick up and actually hold on to is our strategy on a, play, a page. So this is everything that you need to know about our 2024 to 26 strategy on one page. Um, so we have some great visual aids uh, developed with the help of our very talented communications team. So we're thankful to have documents like this to help us communicate our plan to staff and to the community. So just in terms of the overall key components, you will recall that we did bring those before you in September and you did approve the key components of our plan. So that's the meat and potatoes. And so just a reminder of those, um, our mission, our vision, and then goals and objectives and actions that are gonna help us to achieve that strategy. And of course, all of that work is guided by our values, which are deeply held principles, um, and how guide our behavior and how we work together as a team. Um, and of course, integrity, respect, inclusiveness, and service. So just to share in more detail about those, um, our vision, again, where we want to go, a place for people to prosper, alive with opportunity. So this is where we want to go and where we've been working towards for several years and where we'll continue um, on that journey. Our mission, working together, committed to our values and serving our community. And so this is why we get up every day, why we do what we do, right? This drives us and motivates us and makes our work really meaningful. And then, of course, as I just mentioned, our values, which help to guide the way that we interact with each other, with the public, and how we make decisions. 
In terms of our goals and objectives, again, goals, what we want to achieve. So you saw in the video us highlight people placed in prosperity. Of course, those are our, our larger goals. And objectives are how we'll achieve them. So they're a little bit more detailed. So under people, foster a community with heart where everyone belongs and is cared for equitably. And then nested underneath people are our objectives of well-being, belonging, vibrant neighborhoods, and inclusion. Under place, you've got placemaking, green spaces, and planning for growth and prosperity, strong cores, getting around, economic support, inclusion and support, sorry, and resiliency. Of course, if you recall from our earlier slide, our strategic actions are the ways that we're gonna bring that in life. So it gets a little bit more uh, tactile and it's the things that we're gonna do to execute on those higher level goals and objectives. And for our members of council, you'll have this sheet um, beside you as well. It's our strategic initiatives highlight sheet. And it's a summary of everything that we're going to do from a strategic aspect in 2024, all of the projects and initiatives that are going to bring this work to life. So on the screen, you'll see there's an example of one project that we're going to do, but this sheet has everything. And so there's quite a few initiatives that we're going to undertake. So some of those are multi-year initiatives. They're ones that we've been working on and will continue to work on and some of them are new this year and again they're multi-year so they may continue on but a whole host of of work um, underway and there'll be more as we develop our 2025 business plan and you'll remember too just another quick note as we go through the various strategic actions we do have 13 of them and we do categorize them in two buckets, so the lead and the collaborate. And of course, as a two-tier municipality, we have the jurisdiction to lead in some areas, and then we must work really closely with partners in others where we collaborate. So things like social services, for instance, um, climate action, those types of things. So we, it's important to make that differentiation between the two. Okay, so I did talk about these documents earlier. I talked about the one pager. What you'll also see for our members of council and what will be available online tomorrow for the public is our longer version of our plan. So this tells you a little bit more about the what and the why and, and how everything ties together and how it's important. And so those are two uh, key documents to refer to to learn more about our plan. And arguably, as I mentioned before, implementation is really important. So that's how we're going to bring everything to life. So a plan is only as good as how you implement it and how you make it real for folks, both in the community and internally for our staff. And so we've done a lot of work to make sure that this plan is going to live and breathe beyond today um, and beyond the coming weeks and even year. So we've done a lot of work in that first bucket. You'll remember um, when I was here in February, we looked at this and we talked a little bit about some of those things that we were going to do to bring it to life. And so as part of our implementation strategy in that first bucket of prepare, it was really just understanding where we were going, um, figuring out some of those toolkits and, and different things uh, that we were going to offer for staff that would make this real and help support them in both understanding the plan and seeing the role that they play in the bigger picture. So that was a big focus there. Now, as we move on into the inform category, we're looking at a whole host of different things. I think last time we talked about our champions program, which is really um, a, t a grouping of staff who have some extra knowledge in the structure plan. So they're able to kind of work with leaders and work with their peers, answer questions, those kinds of things, and really champion our plan at the front lines. So that's something that's really important. We've developed a whole host of educational and visual tools, some of which you've seen tonight and some uh, you'll be seeing shortly. Um, so for members of council, we do have a council toolkit, which you'll receive in the coming days. And so that's to help you share the plan, right? Whether you want want to share on social media or whether you want to have a whole host of information that you can use uh, to talk to folks about the plan. And we have some very tactile things that you can use and some tools that you might find um, 
you know, really useful when working with partners, when talking to the community. And so that's something that you can look forward to receiving. We've also developed one of those toolkits for our leaders as well. And I believe we talked about that um, in February. So we're also uh, going to go to divisions, we're going to talk to all of our groups, and we're going to run some exercises with our teams, again, to help illustrate the role that we all play and how we're going to move forward. Um, we are going to advisory committee um, meetings to introduce those groups to the plan, and then also uh, participation in public events. So we're going to a whole host of uh, different events, a Waterloo Region Police Open House. We will be going to our BOC Open House. We will be attending all of the mayor pop-up events. So we have a whole host of things that we're doing um, to be able to reach out to the community, and we'll continue to look for opportunities to do that um, as we move along. So as you move into that enable um, bucket, again, more education, visual tools, and we'll really start to do a lot of storytelling. And so this is where we can really be proud of our plan, right? We'll start to see a lot of achievements happening. We'll start to see progress. And we'll talk about the way that we're both measuring and reporting on that progress. And we're working on that measurement framework that we talked about in February. And so that will come back to you shortly for uh, review and more discussion. But we're looking for ways to meaningful measure, meaningfully measure the progress that we're making and be able to tell those stories um, in a new and exciting way. So lots more to come um, from that perspective. Okay, so as I mentioned on the last slide, uh, pending your approval today, launch will begin. Um, and we will start sharing very broadly. Um, and then we'll also be continuing to work on, again, that storytelling, participation in public events, um, meeting people where they're at and having more conversations, um, and then more work on the monitoring and reporting framework. It's going to take all of us to bring this plan to life. And so we're really looking forward to continuing to work very closely as we find ways to celebrate our success and share our success in a, in a more enhanced and meaningful way. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take uh, any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Jenna, for your presentation. Are there any questions for staff? Councillor Schwery. Uh, thank you, Chair. And thank you, Jenna, for your presentation. Uh, one thing I'm, I'm seeing missing, but I'm not even sure if it's part of your, in your strategic plan, is ways to clean up Cambridge. And when I mean clean up, like it's, there's a lot of garbage. I get a lot of calls from people that there's garbage um, thrown around. There's not enough garbage bins. Um, and it, it just, areas look very dumpy. Is that part of a plan to kind of clean up core areas, our city? So we do have a couple of strategic actions that are related to that. So establish our core areas as attractive destinations and potentially safe and healthy neighborhoods touches maybe on that a little bit. Um, so any suggestions, I mean, certainly, um, I'm sorry, through the chair, um, any suggestions that you have, we're happy to take. I think um, the right venue would be through our annual business planning process. And so um, we will be looking to kick that process off shortly, and that's to help to um, you know, certainly decide what initiatives and projects we're going to do in 2025. And so that may be... Um, something that staff can consider um, as part of that process. Yep. Thank you. Councillor Earnshaw. Thank you, Chair Kimson. Uh, I don't have a question, but I do want to compliment Jenna and her staff, particularly with respect to this one page summary, which is a masterful and understandable explanation of a strategic plan to understand how the goals and the objectives and the strategic strategic actions work together to implement the plan. It's hard to get a grasp of that when you're working your way through all the parts and pieces of it, but this is, this is excellent. Thank you very much. Through the chair, thank you so much for that uh, feedback. And certainly um, my gratitude goes to our communications team, extremely talented uh, team of graphic designers who helped to bring our vision to life. So thank you so much for for that feedback.
Councillor Schwery, you have the motion. Can you please read it out in its entirety? Move my, sorry, moved by me, seconded by Councillor Kimson, that report 24-060-CD, recommendation report for draft plan of subdivision. Is that the correct? No, sorry. Sorry about that. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Meta, that report 24-003-CRE 2024-2026 strategic plan approval be received and a council approved the 2024-2026 strategic plan as presented in 24-003-CRE Appendix 8 City of Cambridge 2024 to 2026 strategic plan. Thank you, Councillor Schwery. Are there any questions? Does any member of council have any comments? Councillor Ameta. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Corey. I think this is a pretty solid document. So I would say I'm about 99% in support of it, um, but for the other 1% or 5%, um, I did hear a lot from my constituents, and I would like to put forward an amendment to change uh, a part of the wording. I did hear a lot from my constituents on this, and I will be held accountable, but I'm comfortable bringing it forward. So on page 12 of the strategic plan under, um, promote and develop more transportation options. The part where it says preparing for the LRT and related development, I would like to change that to preparing for rapid transit and development. And the reason is I'm hearing all the time from my constituents who have other transportation options they wanna consider. And I think as a city, we should be open to other options in the future if better technologies come along. Now, the planning definition of rapid transit is very broad and LRT would fit under that, even though I don't think it's fast. And my brother tells me every day, it takes him longer than the previous bus system did. But anyways, um, I think rapid transit would allow for a variety of options. And that's why I'm proposing that wording. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ameta. We'll just take a moment here. We're just going to take a two minute re recess while we sort this out. Thank you.
very much, everybody. We're going to take a moment and go to our city manager, uh, Mr. Calder, who's going to provide some background for us. Great. Thank you, Chair Kimson. I just wanted to take an opportunity as, as Councillor Ameta put, put that amendment on the floor and remind Council that at your meeting in September, when you were reviewing the strategic plan, you had debate over the wording on, on page 12 under the section of promote and develop more transportation options. And you actually took a vote on the wording and the wording that's included in the strat plan currently is the wording that you approved back in September. So I just wanted to make you aware that you have already dealt with this, this item and um, it, it remains to be uh, included as, and I'll read what's in there just uh, as a reminder to everybody. This action focuses on the initiatives that enhance transit systems and increases transportation options, including preparing for the LRT and related development. So again, I think what you concluded was that you were supportive of the LRT specifically, but you also sort of left the door open for transportation options. So I think you do have some flexibility within uh, that, uh, that clause of the STRAT plan. And uh, I would suggest that you, you, couldn't, you shouldn't move on uh, Councillor Ameta's amendment. So Chair Kimson, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Mr. Calder. Councillor Ameta, how would you like to proceed? Thank you, uh, Chair uh, Corey. I would like to put the amendment forward if I'm permitted to. If I can't because of the vote, then I would like to vote on this page separately. So vote on the rest, but not page 12. But I would prefer to put the motion for or the amendment forward. We're just going to take a moment. We're going to take a five minute break, everyone.
Thank you very much, everyone, for your patience. Um, the particular item specific to the LRT on page 12 of the strategic plan was debated by council back in September. And at that time, Councillor Ermetta voted against the inclusion of the wording specific to the LRT. So at this time, we cannot move forward with Councillor Ermetta's amendment as it has already been voted upon and we will proceed now with the main motion as written. And so now we have Councillor Schwery to speak. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just, I wasn't here when the vote happened, um, but I do have a concern um, with it. And I'm just gonna, not, not that I can change anything, but when I canvassed and I talked to thousands of people in Ward 1, and I mean thousands, three people wanted the LRT. Nobody else did. So I'm sometimes curious, when we have these strategic plans, are they not um, ones that you consult with the residents? How do you come up with this? Through the chair. Yes, there was um, extensive consultation done in 2020. Um, we talked to over 2,000 uh, residents in the community in various ways. Um, that was my predecessor um, at the time. Um, but there was extensive community engagement done to develop the core components of the plan. Thank you. I wish you would have talked to residents in Ward 1. Councillor Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Chair Kimson, and through you. And thank you very much, Jenna, uh, for your presentation. Um, just regarding the wording of uh, the LRT discussion, that was an amendment I moved back in October, and we did have extensive discussion on it, and it was voted on. And I think it was voted on, and it went through because we as a city need to strategically look at the future towards innov innovative, exciting, forward-thinking ideas, which includes a variety of modes of transportation, be it GoTransit, which is included in the strategic plan, be it LRT. So I think this is not a document that sets the city into stone. It is a visioning exercise that should get all of us excited as policymakers, as staff, as residents, as to where we can all go together in the future if we work together, collaborate, and we take bold steps to realize a progressive and exciting vision, recognizing what the city can be. So I have no issue including words in here, which I think, well, this is worthy of exploration. Let's look at it, let's study it, let's engage it, let's see where it goes. So I just wanna thank you and your staff for all the work and all of the extensive community consultation that you engaged in every ward to do your due diligence to put together a fantastic strategic plan. So thank you, appreciate it. You're the chair, thank you so much. I'd like to go to Deputy City Manager Cheryl Zonleiter. Thank you. Through the chair, um, to follow up on um, some of the discussion, I would like to also add that with respect to the language related to uh, LRT specifically and transportation options more generally, this is part of the vision setting exercise. It is still within the purview of council through the budget and business planning um, processes and ongoing engagement with the community on specific projects for folks to have feedback and for council to decide what that will look like in practice. So the language in the document is about priorities, how we bring those priorities to life is part of the exercise that we undertake uh, at all of our council meetings and as we decide where to allocate our efforts and resources to meet the community's expectations and needs. So there will be an ongoing opportunity for constituents and council to shape what that will look like in a more meaningful way as we move through the life of the plan. And I hope that that provides some clarification. Thank you very much, Councillor Meta. Well, thank you, Chair Corey, and I do appreciate all the feedback that I've heard. And the reason I brought that amendment forward, even though we had already debated it, is the motion does say to approve the plan as presented, and this is the wording that's in the document. 
and my residents still have concerns with that wording. So I brought that forward and I'm being held accountable for that. And um, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other questions or comments, I'd like to call for the vote. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that motion carries with a vote of five to two. Our next, our next item is item 8-3-1, report 24-050-CD, recommendation report for zoning bylaw amendment 84 Chalmers Street North. We have the applicant, Mark Longo, here to provide some comments. Welcome, Mark. You'll have five minutes to street. Thank you. Um, through you, Chair. Um, typically in past uh, meetings, I've seen staff first present their findings and report prior to delegates. I just wanted to confirm if um, my understanding of that order is incorrect. As uh, staff was ready to present uh, their, their summary. Just a moment, please. Thank you. We apologize for the confusion. We're actually going to um, have our planner, Sansi Sebastian, start off the discussion first. Thank you. Sorry about that confusion. Welcome, Sansi. Good evening, council, staff, and all in attendance tonight. I'm Sansa Sebastian, a planner with the city. I'll be doing a very brief presentation on the recommendation for approval of the zoning bylaw amendment for 84 Chalmers Street. Can I have the slides? The presentation slides. Just a moment, please. To provide an overview of the subject lands, the subject site is 870 square meters with a lot frontage of 22.46 meters. This is currently a, there is currently a single detached dwelling on the site proposed to be demolished to redevelop the subject property. The site is surrounded by single and semi-detached dwellings. The neighboring property at 78 Chalmers Street North is identified to as heritage listed. To go on with the development proposal, the proposal is to build a semi-detached dwelling and additional, resident, additional residential unit is also proposed on the second floor of each semi-detached dwelling. To facilitate the development of semi-detached dwelling, a zoning bylaw amendment is proposed to rezone the lands from R4 to RS1. In future, a consent application will also be submitted to sever the property into two lots one, with one semi-detached dwelling unit per lot. The existing policy and zoning framework, as per the existing uh, policy and zoning framework, the official plan designation for the site is low to medium density residential and is in the city's built up area. The site is zoned residential R4 that permits to have single detached dwellings. The zoning bylaw amendment. 
The property is currently zoned R4. The proposed zoning bylaw amendment is to rezone the subject land from R4 to RS1 with site-specific provision to prohibit geothermal wells on site. I would also like to provide additional information around the additional residential unit. The subject site without severance can have only one ARU. However, post-severance, the subject property can have one ARU on each part of the semi-detached dwelling. Further, to have up to two ARUs in each part of the semi-detached dwelling, the applicant would have to meet the parking requirements, including 45% minimum landscape open space in the front yard. The staff recommendation. As per the requirements set under official plan policy 4.10.5, a cultural heritage impact assessment was submitted to the Municipal Heritage Advisory Committee, MHAC, on April 4, 2024. Heritage planning staff and MHAC have no concerns with the proposed development. MHAC also supported the heritage planning staff recommendations therein. The applicant has also stated to abide by the recommendation put forth by the heritage planning staff to retain the large tree in the front and to include a row of plantings along the southern property line, particularly in the open space between properties. Planning staff is of the opinion that the proposed development is compatible with the existing residential development along Chalmers Street North, which includes a variety of two story single detached and semi-detached dwellings. Staff reviewed the planning nature of the application against applicable planning policies and is recommending approval of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment as outlined in the bylaw attached to the council report 24050CD. Thank you. I would like to ask for any questions regarding the recommendation. Um, we're going to hear from the applicant at this time, and then we'll go to questions afterwards, please, if we can. Thank you. Through the chair, good evening once again. Um, I wanted to uh, first uh, thank uh, council and staff present here tonight uh, for their time and allowing me to speak. Um, just to briefly reiterate uh, staff's uh, recommendation, the, so, the report is supportive of the proposal and many of the concerns that have been raised um, both by internal staff as well as the public have been addressed. Seeking a zone change, um, this property looks at um, changing the designation from R4 to RS1 to permit a semi-detached, which is in keeping with other semis on the street um, and it seeks to create a half width lot for, for each half about from 66 feet uh, currently in total width to 33 feet wide. Um, th this is in keeping with a number of the lots on the opposite side of the street that are 33 feet um, in width. The public consultation um, has exceeded uh, statutory requirements. I have shared my contact with uh, my neighbors. Um, I remain open to engaging with them uh, as uh, design matures um, and as uh, I progress through the various approvals, um, the C of A being next and then building permit. The proposal follows all policies and zoning bylaw. Uh, no site-specific variances are requested by us, um, as outlined in the staff uh, summary. Um, the region just requires a site-specific uh, requirement uh, with respect to geothermal wells. At the public meeting, we heard uh, some uh, concerns with respect to the architecture. Uh, I just wanted to share that the renderings uh, unfortunately didn't depict clearly uh, the inclusion of some brick um, at the base on, on the ground floor, um, but there is an intention to introduce brick uh, and or stone on the street elevations. The material selection is in keeping with the palette throughout the neighborhood. Uh, there's an array of material types within the neighborhood, siding, both vinyl um, and wood. Uh, there's stone, brick, stucco, um, to name a few. 
The detailing will continue to be refined as we advance the design. There are already trim and fascia details incorporated into the design that will pull cues from the neighborhood. And as I stated um, previously, I am committed to continuing to engage my neighbors should they desire more info as the design uh, develops. At the public meeting, we heard some impassioned arguments against the proposal, and um, I, I'm happy to come back up to the podium to answer any questions Council may have, um, and happy to turn uh, the podium over to the delegates at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mark. Do we have any questions for Mark? Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chair Kimson, and through you, and thank you for your presentation. Um, sorry, so you mentioned that you're still open to meeting with the residents when it comes to some of the final design pieces, because I know that was one of the main concerns that folks had was um, sort of maybe the extra modern style of, um, of the development. So is that something that you'd still be open to meeting with them as you continue through the design? There's still room for some flexibility there? Uh, there's certainly flexibility in the um, uh, the mapping of materials and some of the detailing. Um, with respect to the form that's pretty set on the function that occurs within the, the, the built form, um, and so uh, the layout of the spaces and um, their relationship to the exterior environment uh, dictates the, the form in this case. So the, the dressing of the form is certainly something that is still open to refinement. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Chair Kempson, through you. Um, thank you very much for your uh, delegation. Um, not sure if this is a question for staff. Uh, are we asking questions of staff as well right now, or is it just the delegation? I guess I could ask both and see who. We're just going to do questions for um, Mark at this okay. time, and then we'll go to staff after. Sure, I'll ask the question to Mark. Thank you. Let the question hang. Thank you. Um, part of the concerns we were hearing through emails and through the previous delegations that came up at the last meeting were the number of potential units that would result years down the line. So my understanding is there's two semi-detached properties, and an ARU would be added to each semi-detached property, which is permitted. Is there any plan to further subdivide or create even more units? And the question of staffs, so I don't think that's possible, but I was going to ask you if that would be a possibility or if that's a, an intention a year or five years down the line. So as the proposal currently stands, um, there are only four units proposed in total. Um, should a future owner decide to add what is allowable as of right or perhaps seek a variance, um, that, that's beyond my scope at this time. Um, as long as I'm the property owner, should, should this approval be successful, um, we would only be seeking to have a total of four units on, on that site. Um, and I, I just wanted to add, if I may, through the chair, um, that the properties across the street being 33 wide um, lots, um, as of right now, there could be easily uh, three units per lot. So the aggregate width that would be equivalent to the lot uh, in this application. Uh, that density could exist across the street. So I'm, I'm not asking for anything more than what the neighborhood um, is, is currently allowed as of right. But I have scaled that back and I have been transparent in this proposal that we're only looking at four units. Right, thank you. Councillor Earnshaw. Thank you, Chair Kimson. And my question follows along from that, Mark. Thanks for your presentation. Um, my understanding is that with the uh, application you've made tonight, if it's approved, you'll be able to build semi-detached units. That's correct. One on each half of the space. But as it stands now, only one of them could have an additional residential unit uh, unless and until the semi-detached building is further segregated into two lots, at which time then the second uh, additional residential unit could be added to come to the four that you're looking for. Am I right so far? Uh, through the chair, um, 
so and perhaps staff can clarify this um uh as i understand it um two uh, three units in total are allowed as of right on the site right. um should the semi-detached uh designation be approved uh we would only be seeking to add a fourth um, and I apologize if I, I didn't follow your, your train of yeah, thought. No, I, 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 I'm just confirming, and I think you've just uh, confirmed my understanding is correct. Um, but you're only able, as I understand the, the report from the staff, and perhaps this is a question for staff, uh, to separate it, the two parts into two separate lots so that you can get to the four units you're talking about if you comply with the other requirements of the, the zoning for, um, it was uh, front yard spacing and landscaping or something like that. I can't remember what the requirements were, but it, it would be only if you could meet those requirements, you'd be able to divide it. Am I also correct on that? Uh, through the chair, yes. And so currently the site, um, satisfies both our four zoning requirements, and if the semi-detached um, is allowed, the two resultant lots, once uh, we, we go through the Committee of Adjustment Consent process, uh, those uh, narrower lots with the proposal before you would still be compliant to the zoning bylaw. Uh, so there would be no variances within that that solution. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Councillor Cooper. Yes, thank you, Chair Kimson. Um, I'm just going to tag on to what um, Councillor Enshaw has been saying there. Um, so if you get this, <clears throat> this zoning change to permit the semi-detached dwelling, you're going to get the four units you're after, correct? That's correct. Okay, well, it states here that the applicant intends to apply for a severance um, in the future. Is that correct? Uh, through the chair, so um, to, to clarify, um, the fourth unit is only permissible if uh, the lot is severed. So the first step is the zone change from R4 to RS1, which is um, uh, what is being voted on today. Then the next step would be to go to Committee of Adjustment and uh, apply for a severance of the, the property. Okay, so you need both in order to get these four units. That's correct. Okay, thank you. That's what I wanted to clarify. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for answering the questions. Um, I'm wondering if you've given any consideration to whether or not you would be willing to make a contribution to the city's affordable housing fund, um, going from a lot that's currently zoned for a one unit single detached house to um, four units, if you'd be willing to make a contribution per unit to that fund. Uh, and through the chair, that that is uh, certainly uh, something that I'm I'm happy to consider. Uh, I'm not certain though whether tonight's decision would um, uh, would determine that commitment or not. Um, it it is something that I'm happy to discuss with staff moving forward. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We'll have staff up and have some questions for staff if there are any. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, Sansi, we're going to ask you to sit down again. We're just going to um, hear from the delegations first. We have two pre-registered delegations um, for this public meeting. The first person is Aaron Klein. Is Aaron here presently? Thank you, Aaron. You have five minutes to speak. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, good evening, councillors. Um, my name is Aaron Klein, and I'm here to uh, speak about the potential approval for the application for the zoning amendment for 84 Chalmers Street North. Um, I'm going to start off by saying I can't help but feel a little disappointed in the fact that this zoning amendment has been approved of, uh, has the approval of planning staff uh, without the inclusion of delegates written and submitted comments um, or have even responded to a single concern brought forth. Um, 
it is premature to make any decision on this amendment without receiving a full planning response to the valid questions that have been raised. Um, now this unfortunately leaves council in a fairly dramatic predicament uh, where in the development, uh, developer can file an appeal on the reversal of a premature uh, approval and there hasn't been sufficient, uh, if any, response to the information uh, for the public to provide appropriate feedback. Uh, no, no draft bylaw was provided in any format, and as de demonstrated by the delegates written comments, uh, insufficient information was provided for the public to understand the proposed amendments and its role in the future of this proposed development, uh, which still have yet to be addressed. Um, the report frames it as though this rezoning isn't intended to facilitate the consent, and that is incorrect. They need to justify the consent through this rezoning report as there is actually um, Oh, my apologies. Um, rezoning uh, to allow the semi detached housing on a single lot. That's under Bill 23, so that uh, uh, once uh, they can move straight to severance to, to build the uh, current uh, application. Um, what you'll find is that the Planning Act in Bill 185 is in the process of changing to remove the appeal rights for neighbors, uh, meaning that a much better and well-informed decision needs to be made as this council is the only entity who can ensure public feedback is considered. Uh, this should be sent back to planning to ensure all questions and comments submitted have been given a full response. Um, with all of this said, there is still uh, only and solely financial motive behind this overdevelopment proposal and the intent needs to be considered. Uh, the current dwelling, though perfectly suitable for a low to moderate income family, has not been rented out in over nine years and could still be rented to a family in need today when it is needed today. Uh, contrary to the applicant's claim of overdevelopment being for the greater good, um, the application's reference to the development as two duplexes, uh, yet the applicant has stated multiple times he will rent all four units independently. So it cannot be both two units and four units simultaneously in languages, extremely important. Uh, there has been no information provided on the proposed rent. Neighborhood feedback uh, was not sought prior to. Um, he has explained that it uh, is still open, though that hasn't been communicated to the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, and there's been no further consideration or amendment to the optic compatibility size or council and delegate feedback from the last meeting. Uh, we have currently garnered over 100 signatures on a uh, on a form, uh, primarily from neighbors in opposition uh, who share the same view. Um, this is only the first of a two-step process where council decision and community feedback is able to ensure that this overdevelopment doesn't set a dangerous precedent. It cannot be stated enough that after this housing crisis is inevitably solved, whenever that may be, that we have to be proud of and accepting of all the decisions made now without remorse or regress as the decisions made today will last a lifetime. Um, I would encourage a comprehensive inventory of the neighborhood uh, wherein you'll find nothing of comparison to what is being proposed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Emetta. Thank you, Chair Corey. Thank you, thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is, so you know we're pretty tight for time in making a decision. What would you like to see done with this property? Like, what do you think the neighborhood could live with? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, I think a maximum of, of three units is acceptable, and I would encourage anybody to drive the neighborhood and take inventory of the current houses there and find something more suitable. Um, we have more uh, neighbors uh, on the opposition today. Uh, a couple, unfortunately, couldn't be here, but as they've been notified and start to look into this project a little bit more, uh, it's apparent that it's not compatible with the rest of the neighborhood. Do we have any other questions for the delegation? Seeing none, thank you very much for delegating tonight. I now have Alana Klassen. Ms. Klassen, thank you. Welcome and please begin, you'll have five minutes to speak. Good evening, Chair Kimson and council members. My name is Alana Clausen and I am a direct neighbor to 84 Chalmers Street North. To allow this quadplex to be built as proposed would be doing disservice to our community. There is no comparable dwelling of its size in our neighborhood and it barely aligns with the city's official plan. I have major concerns specifically regarding the parking, functionality and open space. 
Chalmers Street North is a major thoroughfare for first responders. I personally observe fire trucks weekly using our street to connect to the south. We have no parking permitted on our streets, and on our few blocks alone, we have had numerous house fires and medical emergencies over the past decade. The neighbor to the south, the heritage designated home, currently uses the parking, parking space of 84 Chalmers for both commercial and personal vehicles and has so for years. The addition of a quadplex inevitably means more congestion on our already narrow streets and poses a risk to public safety. The city planner has failed to include our written comments and has not responded to many of the concerns that we have raised. The planning justification is insufficient and should not have been deemed a complete application. It provides no assessment of the setbacks, lot coverage, massing, or architectural details of the neighboring properties and fails to demonstrate how the proposal satisfies the official plan. There was no mention of the minimum 45% landscaped open space requirement in the front yard and neglects park parking restrictions that prohibit parking in front of a regulatory building. I understand that this meeting this evening is to decide whether or not 84 Chalmers Street will be rezoned for the ultimate goal of severance and development. I do not need to continue to point out the inadequate, in, inadequacies in this proposal. With the information that we have provided tonight and in our previous meeting, this proposal, proposal at the very least should be deferred and sent back to planning staff to ensure that all comments and questions have been given a full response before a decision is made. Ultimately, what I am asking from Council tonight is to not permit this rezoning. Instead, I would like to suggest a three-unit development which would better align with the official plan, functionality, parking, neighborhood aesthetics, and open space and would not require rezoning. Please keep in mind that the dangers of Bill 23. If this lot is severed, regardless of what the developer has planned or his intentions, there is always a potential for six units in the future, and this would set a serious precedent and be a detriment to our neighborhood. I would like to remind Council that under Bill 185, the Planning Act is in the process of changing to move appeal rights for neighbors. This means that council is the only governing body who can ensure neighborhood feedback is considered, and I hope that this time our concerns have been heard. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Alana. Do I have any questions from members of council? Wonderful. Thank you for delegating. Thank you. I'd now like to ask staff member Sansi Sebastian to come up and answer some questions. And my apologies to everyone for the confusion. We um, we went off order with the script earlier this evening. So questions now for staff. Councillor Earnshaw. Thank you, Chair Kimson. Uh, uh, both uh, the delegates from the community suggested that uh, the planning staff had not considered submissions that were made at the uh, earlier meeting. And I'd like to ask Sansi if she would address that, please. Uh, through the chair, the submissions that were made through the public meeting last time, the comments are addressed in the public input section of the report. Uh, the concerns that uh, which details about the concerns of the establishment of the semi-detached dwelling, creating the possibility of the three units being permitted as of right, should the applicant sever the property into three, uh, two separate lots. So uh, as an answer to that question, it was stated that uh, as addressed in the policy analysis section, only once the zoning is in place for the semi-detached dwelling, a severance application could be submitted. So as of right, uh, post zoning, the proposed lot can have only three residential units. Only after post severance can the site have one ARU in addition to the existing ARU on one of the semi-detached. That is only after uh, the consent application, the property gets severed, can the semi-detached have one ARU on each part of the semi-detached dwelling? And uh, going on to the compatibility uh, question raised, uh, the neighborhood of Chalmers Street includes a variety of two-story single detached and semi-detached dwellings as shown in figure eight of the report. The street already has 
two-story semi-detached dwellings along the street. So, uh, and also I would like to uh, point to the attention that a ZBA is not required to permit ARUs as of, uh, as up to two ARUs are permitted on all single detached, semi-detached and townhouse dwelling on residential use, on residential lots throughout the city subject to meeting zoning provisions. As per the provincial regulations through Bill 23, uh, the municipalities cannot restrict ARUs as long as they are residential lots serviced by municipal service and can accommodate one parking space per ARU in accordance with the Planning Act. So looking into the requirement for the parking space, uh, the applicant has showcased that, and it, it has been reviewed through the zoning review that there is adequate parking to provide two parking space on the site, one for the primary dwelling and one for the ARU. And uh, to provide, uh, I would also like to add that in this case, the applicant has been transparent about wanting to include ARUs in the development at the beginning of the proposal. This is encouraged as it helps city staff to accommodate legal ARUs that are subject to zoning and building permit review and will form part of city's ARU inventory. Therefore, this represents good planning and is in public interest. Thank you. Councillor Hamilton. Thank you, Councillor Gibson, and uh, through you, thank you. Uh, my question has to do with the request that we we're receiving from the delegations to say, well, if we drop the units count from four to three, mm -hmm. is that drop, would that drop be worthy of consideration? Would it make a substantial difference or is the drop of four to three relatively little difference? Uh, so the drop to four to three, like while reviewing through the chair, uh, while reviewing the zoning consideration for semi-detached dwelling, um, all the setbacks, minimum lot area, minimum landscape open space, lot frontage, um, parking space requirement, were all reviewed to see if four units can be accommodated on the site. And from the review, it was identified that yes, four units can be accommodated on the site with required zoning regulations in place. Thank you. Councillor Earnshaw. Thank you, Chair Kimson. Uh, the report which we received in our materials indicated that the uh, uh, Heritage uh, Committee had not yet finalized its uh, consideration of this uh, application, but I believe you said in your original presentation that that's now complete and that the Heritage Committee has no concerns. Uh, through the chair, uh, so when the report was written, uh, the MHAC was not happened. Like uh, the MHAC happened on April fourth, and we have received uh, the feedback that they are uh, they support the recommendations set forth by the heritage planning staff, and they don't have any concerns with the application. And the recommendation from the heritage planning staff was to retain majorly the tree in the front and also to have planting buffers towards the south property line to provide adequate buffer between the heritage property and the uh, current proposed development to which the applicant has agreed to abide by. Thank you. Um. Our chief planner, Ms. Prime, would like to speak if we may, and then we'll be on to Councillor Cooper. Sorry, through you, uh, Chair. Um, I just wanted to clarify, and perhaps it was clear, um, but through the discussion in Sansi's slides, um, the zoning amendment application, it just, just allows up to three units. It's a future severance, a, a future committee of adjustment application, as Councillor Cooper pointed out, that is required to then um, sever the property into two separate buildings and allow that fourth unit to come forward. So perhaps Council was aware of that, but I just wanted to make sure it was clear what was in front of you today versus what requires a further application. Um, as Sansi noted, the applicant has been very transparent about his big long-term plans, but I didn't want to confuse um, what he may choose to do in a, a next application with what's in front of you now. So hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Prime. Councillor Cooper. 
Yes, thank you, Chair Kimson. Um, and I know that uh, one of the concerns that we've all been hearing is whether this severance could possibly lead to the, what I guess would be six units um, in the future. Um, I just wonder, I wonder if it's possible to kind of calm some of the, the fears. Has, has stuff, anyone actually looked at that, whether, I guess I'm thinking from a parking perspective, whether it could even be possible? Because if there's no way that's possible, and that would maybe go a long way to calming some of the fears. Could it be done? So th through you, Chair, I'll, I'll take that question. Oh, can you hear me? Um, so that, you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> can hear myself. Um, we would we would have to review that based on what they would want to do in adding another ARU. Certainly, parking is an important provision that is required, and it, with no street parking on the street, like you know, you, you do have to meet the zoning requirements of open space as set out. That is part of zoning, so that is what's reviewed when staff review those requests for building permit for ARUs. So. You know, I don't have a configuration in front of us. We do know that um, I believe there is no direct access available from the backyard because of um, the setback. So that would limit what could happen perhaps in the backyard. As you know, we have a provision that could allow um, a third unit that's separate, right? Mm -hmm. So so all of those parameters have to be reviewed. Um, I, would, I would suggest it's not necessarily likely that three units could go into each half, but I can't give you any kind of guarantee 100%. So it's probably a high percentage though, if not. Okay. So Thank you, I appreciate it's, that. It's hard without the information and like to assess an application, right? So I don't wanna, yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll cut the front of Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions for staff? Seeing none, thank you very much, Sansi. Councillor Earnshaw, you have the motion. Could you please read it in its entirety? Thank you, Chair Kimson. It's moved by me and seconded by Councillor Roberts that report 24-050-CD, recommendation report for zoning bylaw amendment 84 Chalmers Street North be received, and that Cambridge Council approves the proposed zoning bylaw amendment to amend the zoning of the site from residential R4 to residential RS1 S.4.1476 to permit the development of a semi-detached dwelling containing two dwelling units. And that council is satisfied that the requirements for a public meeting in accordance with subsection 17 of section 34 of the Planning Act has been met. And further, that the bylaw attached to this report be passed. Thank you, Councillor Earnshaw. Are there any questions? Does council have any comments? Councillor Imata? Well, uh, thank you, Chair uh, Corey, and I appreciate all the feedback that we've heard tonight, and I appreciate um, what staff have had to say. However, um, I am concerned about the number of units, and the reason I'm concerned, and this is my own opinion, I think to myself, what if every other property owner in the street comes forward with plans to redevelop their property? And I know that's highly unlikely, but we're gonna be seeing a lot more infill development happen in our city. And um, with three units already being permitted, I'm not comfortable giving any more. So uh, that's my opinion. Thank you very much, Councillor Ameta. Councillor Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Chair Kimson, and through you. Um, this is always a difficult one because you, you hear delegations and you hear neighbours and you always want to make sure that all residents are satisfied leaving a council chamber. Um, but what troubles me, of course, is that this has already been demonstrated in this report to be consistent with the provincial policy statement, the 2020 provincial growth plan, the region of Waterloo official plan, the city of Cambridge official plan. Um, and to me, this looks like what we would describe as gentle density. When we look at the difference between three units to four units, I, I don't see that difference as being certainly one that could make a small impact, but the size of that impact on the scale of densification we're seeing in a growing city, uh, it, it doesn't lead me to reject an application such as this. I think we have to accept that the nature of Cambridge 
whether the area is low, medium, or high density is changing. And what used to be prescribed 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when some of these lots were initially designed, 40 years down the line, it's changed. We have more cars, we have more people, we have population influxes, we have different modes of employment that are popping up, we have different modes of transportation. So when I see zoning bylaw amendments being brought forward in old areas of the city, I'm not shocked because that's just what change in a city is. So whether it's three units or four units, putting that within the overall growth of the city in areas such as this, I don't see this change as being jarring enough to reject an application such as this when we know we need the housing. And we know that because it conforms to the province, the region, and the city, there's a very high probability that this could go to the OLT. And we know that when it does, on average, 97% of applications that go to the OLT are voted on in favor of the developer. So I think if we look at where the city is going in terms of density, the need for housing, and the fact that the difference from three units to four units is somewhat negligible, I'm inclined to support a proposal like this because this is what gentle densification in a growing city does look like today. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Earnshaw. Thank you, Chair Kempson. Uh, what concerns me about these situations is always that uh, emotional turmoil is caused in the uh, residences surrounding the proposed development. Uh, but I'm always uh, mindful of the fact that we have a very skillful and highly trained planning staff. Uh, I was satisfied by the questions that I asked of Sansi that she had carefully considered the concerns of the neighbors. She would carefully considered, as Councillor Hamilton says, all of the uh, statutory uh, and uh, official plan uh, deliberations that are necessary, had considered the uh, submissions of the residents from the earlier meeting and was recommending, recommending that we accept uh, this proposal. I will be voting in favor of it on that basis. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Inshaw. And I'd like to comment on this, if I may, for a moment. Um, the, the provincial policy does support these types of changes in density, and we know that ARUs are being encouraged. What I would like to share is to urge developers or those residents who are wishing to add ARUs to their properties or assist with the housing crisis by gently increasing density to please consider the design when bringing forward an application. Now, we know that the policy does not allow us as council to weigh in on design except in specific situations where they may be adjacent to a heritage property or part of a uh, particular district or where there's a secondary plan. But I think in the interest of being good neighbors, it's something that I'd like people to consider that when they're building something, try to find a way to make it fit in as best as possible. And that might make these situations a little less stressful for those involved. Thank you. And now I'll ask the clerk to call for the vote. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that carries at a vote of six to one. Our next item is number 8-3-2, report 24-060-CD, recommendation report for draft San draft plan of subdivision 30T, as in Thomas, dash 20103, dash 285 Limerick Road. We have a presentation from Vincent Wen, planner. Welcome, Vincent. Thank you. Good evening, Chair, members of Council, City staff, and members of the public. My name is Vincent Wen, and I'm a planner with the City. I'm here to present the draft plan of subdivision application that has been submitted for the property municipally addressed as 285 Limick Road. The purpose of this presentation is to provide a recommendation of draft approval to the regional municipality of Waterloo on the proposed draft plan of subdivision consisting of seven street fronting townhouse lots and one future development block. 
A zoning bylaw amendment application was approved in 2022 to amend the zoning from R2 to RM4 with site-specific provisions as well as a holding provision. Concerns received during the public consultation process regarding increased traffic, safety, noise, and potential decrease of surrounding property values were considered as part of the approved zoning bylaw amendment. The city's transportation department has reviewed the proposal and is not concerned that the creation of seven residential lots would generate a significant amount of traffic. With respect to safety, a sidewalk will be provided for the proposed development on Limerick Road for pedestrian travel. Regional and city staff have no concerns with respect to noise from this proposed development. Lastly, the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation, or MPAC, assesses the values of properties using a variety of factors. Property values are not a consideration in land use planning recommendations. The proposed plan of subdivision implements the approved zoning bylaw amendment. The subject property is located on the west side of the McRoad, south of Naughty Pine Avenue, and east of Plum Beach Crescent. The property is approximately 1,700 square meters in area. The property is designated greenfield area and low slash medium density residential in the city's official plan and is currently zoned multiple residential RM4 with site-specific provisions and a holding for block eight. As mentioned, the proposed draft plan subdivision consists of seven townhouse lots, one future development block, and a road winding along Limerick Road. A holding provision was placed on block eight, which will remain undeveloped until such time access is established to those lands. Comments received from council, the public, as well as staff and circulated agencies were addressed as part of the zoning bylaw amendment application as approved by council in 2022. The proposed plan of subdivision implements the approved site-specific zoning bylaw amendment and conforms to provincial, regional, and city policies. Staff recommend approval of the proposed plan of subdivision subject to the city's draft plan conditions. Council recommendation on this plan of subdivision will be forwarded to the region of Waterloo, who is the approval authority for plans of subdivision. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Vincent. Are there any questions for staff? Councillor Schwery, you have the motion. Could you please read it in its entirety? Thank you, Chair. I'm sent. Moved by my boom by myself, seconded by Councillor Armada, that report 24-060-CD recommendation report for draft plan of subdivision 30T-20103-285 Limerick Road be received. And the council advised the regional municipality of Waterloo that the city of Cambridge recommends draft approval for, for draft plan of subdivision. 30T-20103, subject to the draft approval conditions included in Appendix D attached to this report. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call for the vote. Oh, sorry, Councillor Meta, you have a comment? Or a question? No, I actually comment, Councillor uh, Corey or Chair Corey. Thank you. So um, through you, um, I do support this motion and the application, but I would like to provide some direction. Um, so I was on council when the original subdivision was approved um, back in my first term on council, which I think it was in 2011 or 2012, something like that. The council at the time, myself included, when we had passed um, Linden Drive as being the main road, we wanted Limerick Road to kind of have a more unique character to it. So my comments are around that, that when um, the site plan, or, the, or I should say the elevation designs and stuff, I'd like us to go the extra mile on the design, if we can, to work with the applicant on that. We, don't, we didn't want Limerick Road 
to look like it was just another road in the subdivision. We wanted it to be a little more unique. So I'd like I'd like to just provide some direction that we can work with the applicant on the design of the townhouses so that it doesn't just look like it's an extension of the subdivision, that it, it retains more of that unique character that the rest of the street has. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Ameta. Councillor Schwery. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just have a comment to make that um, has been bothering me. I notice in this uh, draft here, it is uh, stated that um, prior to the registration that the owner developer agrees to make a contribution to the affordable housing contribution fund. I don't feel that this should be uh, a requirement for, for developers, if they like to, they may, but to put this as a requirement when there is really no plan for affordable housing and it almost feels um, that they're pushed into that. So I'm not comfortable with that. Thank you very much, Councillor Schwery. I'd like to um, ask Deputy City Manager Hardy Bromberg to speak to that, please. I'm, I'm just wondering if th um, through the chair to Councillor Schwery, um, we typically would ask the developer if, if they'd like to contribute to our affordable housing fund. Um, that's one way that the development industry helps to contribute if, if they're not building affordable homes, that um, they can contribute in other ways to, to the development of affordable homes in our community. But if direction from council is such that um, you wish us not to ask the developer, we can certainly, we won't ask. Um, Councillor Roberts. Yes, thank you. And um, through you, thank you, Mr. Bromberg, for that. I think it's very important that we have the continue to have these conversations with developers, considering we don't have um, something like inclusionary zoning here, where we're, um, you know, in sort of keeping developers in a position where they need to include uh, affordable housing. I think this is one of the only sort of tools that we have uh, to help build up our affordable housing reserve fund, which can be used in a, a number of creative ways to increase our affordable housing inventory, which we desperately need, as we know. So um, I am completely comfortable with having those conversations with developers. And of course, we can't necessarily make them, as Councillor Shiri said, but if they voluntarily say that they're going to uh, contribute to that fund, then I think that we should be happy to accept that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Roberts. Councillor Schwery. Thank you, Chair Kemsen. Just in response to that, here it says agrees to make a contribution. Affordable housing is just another word for low income housing. This should be the responsibility of a provincial government and we should not be burdening taxpayers and future homeowners with this as this will just make more homes more expensive. It seems to me that forcing builders to pay another tax on already high development charges, fees, and long wait times to build. The more fees we add, the more expensive the homes will be. This will only increase affordable housing prices that are supposed to be 80% of the current average price of homes sold. So the more we increase the, the price of homes, that affordable is also going up. So it's really not doing anything. And again, it's in the area of a provincial government. And I feel just adding more and more taxes is not creating, and we're not in the business of building homes as a city. Um, you know, we're not developers. So that's how I feel. Councillor Ameta. Well, thank you, Chair Corey. Through you, um, I do hear the discussion on both sides, I guess. My concern is by eliminating that requirement that the savings will not be passed on to the taxpayer. Like there's no way to guarantee that they would. So I would wanna leave it in there because we do need the, the affordable housing. And I think we should have some financial assistance where possible. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Meta. Councillor Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Chair Kempson, and through you. Um, I think we're getting a bit sidetracked on a discussion about affordable housing when we should be discussing the subdivision proposal, but I have to weigh in on this. Um, we need more affordable housing, not less. We need a lot more affordable housing, not less. And I think we have to remember that the more affordable housing we create for people and families that are in need, the healthier and more vibrant neighborhoods become, the better they become for everyone of all walks of life, of all income brackets. And the concepts that somehow more affordable housing is going to lead to skyrocketing home costs or increase the housing stock or increase taxes, I, I don't buy that. I think history shows that you have the average or at least the medium income earner in Canada right now being priced out of a housing market. So now affordable housing is not low income and there's nothing wrong with low income housing either. I know great people that are in low income housing. I know great people that are in million dollar mansions. And if you put them beside one another, you couldn't tell them apart, right? It reduces desperation. Um, Ah, wow, what a sidetrack we're all on. You know what? I'll just end by saying I think it's our moral and ethical imperative to do whatever we can to help those that are most in need. And those that need affordable housing right now are not what one would typically describe as quote unquote low income, but it's church pastors, it's new teachers, it's master's students that have just graduated. That's who needs affordable housing right now with the cost we're seeing. So if, as Councillor Roberts pointed out, one of our only tools as a municipality is to ask developers to give us money for an affordable housing fund, and that developer says yes, I think that's a great deal that we should take because there's very little else we can actually do to get this housing built because it's not our jurisdiction. So if we have this tool to help us with a dire crisis that we know we need assistance with, why not use it? I think it behooves us morally and ethically to do so at every possible moment. Thanks. Thank you very much, Councillor Hamilton. And I appreciate the comments that everyone has brought forward with regard to this um, discussion about affordable housing, which certainly is important, but is also for another time. So if we could direct back to the motion that is before us, um, if this is something, Councillor Schwery, that you would like to have further discussion with, um, perhaps you could connect with staff and we can look at how this can be best brought forward. And also keep in mind that there has been the development of an affordable housing reserve fund working group. It's a new group and members of the public have been asked to join in. So perhaps that's something that we'll want to learn more about before we um, look at this in general. So do we have any other comments on the motion as read? Councillor Swery, is your comment with regard to the motion? Support. I do support the the development. I just don't like the wording where it's it's coercive to me, uh, forcing the person. So that's it. I don't know how if I can separate it, but I do support the development. But I don't like that wording. Councillor Swery, if I may. Um, through the chair, are you speaking to what's in the report or in this specific recommendation? Yeah. So, through the chair, maybe I could clarify to help a bit. So this is in the conditions for the subdivision agreement. So those conditions are agreed to with the proponent, in this case, um, they've agreed to accept that condition. Um, Hardy already commented on, you know, this is something we get to an agreeable stage with. Um, so in this case, I would suggest it's okay. okay. Um, you could adjust okay. the conditions if you wanted to. Going forward, um, I could see, as, as was noted, perhaps another discussion in general about this issue and how the committee is going to work and how how um, leveraging fees or funds from developers might proceed. So hopefully that helps. Right, 
All right, we're gonna go ahead with the, with the motion as presented. May I ask the clerk to call for the vote? Starting voting. In closing voting. And that carries unanimously. Our next item is number 8-3-3, report 24-040-CD, 50th public art recommendation. Councillor Cooper, you have the motion. Could you please read it in its entirety? Yes, thank you, Chair Kinson. Uh, this is moved by me, seconded by Councillor Roberts. <clears throat> the recommendation that report 24040CD, the 50th public art recommendation be received, and that the agreed upon finalist as presented by the 50th anniversary public art jury and arts and culture advisory committee be accepted, and that the location of the public art as recommended by staff be approved and that council direct staff to award the contract and approve the commissioning of the public art piece. And that council approve an increase of $10,000 to capital project A01439-40, public art 50th anniversary to be funded from the public art reserve fund. And further that the mayor and clerk, uh, clerk be delegated authority to execute a public art contract with the approved artist in a form of agreement satisfactory to the city solicitor. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. Are there any questions? Does Council have any comments? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call for the vote. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that carries unanimously. We have one motion this evening by Councillor Ermetta. This motion was first introduced at the February 27th, 2024 Council meeting. We have one pre-registered delegation for this public meeting. Connie Cody. Welcome Connie and please begin. You have five minutes to speak. Thank you. Chair Kimson, Councillor, staff, I'm Connie Cody. I'm here today as a resident, a taxpayer, and the federal conservative candidate for Cambridge. As a candidate, I'm out in the community knocking on doors and engaging with residents. I'm hearing the overwhelming concerns that people are having, the number one being affordability. It used to be that if you worked hard, you could achieve great things. But lately, no matter how hard a person works, it never seems to be enough. People are being forced to choose between filling up their car, heating their home, and feeding their family. I heard from a couple whose earnings combined gave them a pretty healthy household income. They don't understand how they could be struggling to live. As the housing prices in Cambridge were no longer affordable, they had to move away from family and friends just so they could buy their first time home. Now, after just a few years of home ownership, the rising interest rates and cost of living puts them at risk. Excuse me, Ms. Cody. Yes. Could I ask you to redirect um, specific to the motion at hand, please? Yes, I'm getting there. I'm just explaining how uh, the effect is so that you understand uh, the meaning of it. Um, as a grandmother, it was difficult to see the tears in the eyes of a single mother who's struggling to buy much needed baby formula. In one year, the formula she needed increased in price by 67%. She worries that she won't be able to provide nutritional food for her family, let alone keep a roof over their heads as the costs continue to increase with no reprieve in sight. The carbon tax drives up the price on everything for every person and every business. As it's not a tax that gets applied once, like sales tax, it's multiplied several times on a single product. It makes life more unaffordable. It makes it more costly to build the homes, to buy the food, and to pay the bills. The carbon tax increases the cost of heating fuels, making it more challenging for families to keep their homes warm and comfortable. With so many struggling, the last thing they need is another tax on the essentials we all need to survive. Because of the carbon tax, farmers and producers are facing higher costs, making them less competitive, less productive, and less profitable. These costs trickle down to communities where families are paying more for groceries and where some are now having to skip meals in order to survive. 
This punitive carbon tax sends money and jobs out of this country, making us more dependent on imports from heavier polluting countries that do not have the same responsible environmental regulations that we have in Canada. Small and medium-sized businesses form the backbone of our community. To stay afloat, they will have no choice but to pass the cost of the carbon tax to consumers. Higher costs to these businesses could lead to more closures and job losses. An independent parliamentary budget officer says that most Canadians are still paying more in the carbon tax than they get back in rebates. A family of four will have to pay $700 more in groceries this year because of this inflationary carbon tax. All across Canada, food banks are reporting record-breaking visits. The executive director of our local food bank stated that she has been seeing a steady rise in people accessing their services since January, busier than during the pandemic. She states that the numbers continue to grow month after month and that it's clear that Canadians are experiencing a food security crisis. Reporting warns us that food banks all across our country may not be able to keep up to the demand. Already seven out of 10 premiers signed opposition of the April 1st carbon tax hike. 70% of Canadians oppose the carbon tax hike. Municipalities can and should be the next to get on board. So today I urge you to consider the negative impact that the carbon tax has on our community to affordability. Choose to support this motion to send correspondence to the federal government requesting to cancel the carbon tax as a clear and simple way to help ease financial burdens for our citizens of Cambridge and to encourage other municipalities to do the same. Choose to support this motion so farmers, businesses, friends, and neighbours, all vital parts of our community, can continue to thrive and contribute to our economy. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Connie. Do we have any questions for the delegation? Councillor Earnshaw? Yes, thank you, Chair Kempson, and thank you, Connie. Um, you mentioned a, a parliamentary budget officer who had said something that uh, went past me fairly quickly. And there's a clause in the motion that says that a parliamentary budget officer has admitted uh, that uh, blah, 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 the majority of households will see a staggering loss. Is that, in fact, what uh, the parliamentary budget officer said that you were quoting? The uh, parliamentary budget officer says that there's a uh, negative economic impact to most homeowners and that uh, most uh, people will receive less in a rebate than what they would have to pay. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions for the delegation? Seeing none, thank you very much, Connie. Councillor Ameta, may I ask you to please read your motion aloud? Thank you, Chair Kempson. Yes, I will. This motion is moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Cooper. The recommendation whereas the federal government recently increased the carbon tax in April 2023 and will almost triple it by 2030. And whereas the parliamentary budget officer has admitted that when fiscal and economic impacts of the federal fuel charger consider that the vast majority of households will see a staggering loss. And whereas this tax flows through from producers to transporters to the grocery store floor for our citizens. And whereas this tax does very little to reduce pollution and emissions. And whereas two thirds of Canadians are approximately $200 away or less from not being able to pay all of their bills by the end of the month. Therefore, be it resolved that the City of Cambridge Council direct the clerk to send correspondence urging the federal government to cancel the carbon tax, which is financially hurting our citizens at a time when affordability concerns are at an all-time high to ease the financial and inflationary pressure on our citizens. And, um, the, and further that the correspondence also be sent to AMO and all Ontario municipalities. I'd like to speak to it. Well, thank you, Chair Kempson. 
I would like to take credit for writing this. However, I did not write this, and that's okay. I don't need to write every motion. This motion was in our package. It's been going around the province to a number of, of councils across the province, and it has received quite a bit of support. So I saw this motion. I thought it is speaking my language. It is consistent with what I'm hearing in our community, that a lot of people are really finding it hard to make a living, and this tax just adds to it. And, you know, the way I see it, a tax doesn't solve a problem, you know. I, and I, I would prefer, you know, if we're trying to make positive environmental change, give someone a carrot. Don't hit them over the head with a stick. That's how I see it, right? So I think, you know, um, if we want to get people to change their habits environmentally, like, you know, take transit more and so forth, we need to give people viable alternatives and we should be looking at more tax breaks and things like that to get them to want to switch their behavior. And I really don't think this tax is really doing anything to get people to change their behavior anyways. You know, as we heard tonight, we have a situation where people are actually eating fewer meals a day to be able to afford this. And you know what? I'm hearing it in my ward. I am. And, uh, you know, people are saying to me, Nicholas, you know, I don't eat breakfast anymore. I just eat lunch and dinner. And it breaks my heart. And you know what? I'm going to confess, I do that. I eat two meals a day because I'm at the point where I can't afford things. So, you know, I think a lot of us in the community here, we are in this position. And um, it breaks my heart. You know, Canada used to be so affordable. My parents raised us in a 3,000 square foot house for 2149, you know, and it, it breaks my heart, uh, you know, and um, I hear it all the time from my constituents. So anyways, I, I would prefer, you know, alternatives to get people to, um, to, to make better environmental choices as I've stated. And, you know, uh, the premier very rightfully has come out strongly opposing this. And it's not just Premier Doug Ford. You know, I, I believe um, the leader of the Liberal Party, Bonnie Crombie, said she would not introduce a tax if she's elected. And um, certainly the NDP, Jagmeet Singh, he's also come out against it. So I think there's better ways. And um, I, I can't support, you know, um, the carbon tax. And I think this city should be leading to get it eliminated. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ameta. Councillor Earnshaw. Thank you, Chair Kimson. My concern with this motion, and uh, my concern will lead me to vote against it, uh, is the uh, hyperbole that I see in the whereas clauses. Uh, one of them I mentioned uh, to the delegate, Ms. Cody, um, to say that um, the vast majority of households will see a staggering loss seems to me to be over the top and is even contrary to what Ms. Cody told us the parliamentary budget officer may have said. I'm also concerned about the clause that says this tax has very little to reduce pollution and emissions. That surely is a scientific question that's well beyond our ken, and it's certainly a matter for a debate uh, at uh, uh, tables more austere and uh, august than our own. And finally, I do not know and cannot uh, find support for the statement that two-thirds of Canadians are approximately $200 away or less from not being able to pay all their bills at the end of the month. And if we pass this motion in the form that it's presented, we are underwriting, underlining, and endorsing all of those comments, which I cannot support. I'll be voting against it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Earnshaw. Councillor Schwery. Thank you. Chair Kempson, on my last gas bill, my actual usage was $23.98, and the federal carbon charge was $16.60. That's more than half of my usage, not counting, of course, all the other taxes. The federal government has, within the last year, spent more than $200 billion to fight climate change. The federal carbon tax, according to the feds, say it's crucial to reducing Canada's industrial greenhouse gas emissions. How's that working out? Jill Bro is quoted stating, the government does not measure the annual amount of emissions that are directly reduced by federal carbon pricing. So they're spending money on something they can't even measure. 
if I'm spending money or they're taking my money, I'd like to see the positive effect. The latest government data from 2021 that reports emissions two years after the fact says our emissions went up in 2021 compared to 2020 by 11 million tons to 60, 670 million tons from 659 million tons in 2020. The carbon tax is not doing anything. It's really not necessary. It's just another tax grab. The further strains are already strained taxpayers. Today, Canadians are barely making ends meet. Come to my ward and knock on some doors. And charging an additional tax is shameful. I absolutely support this motion. Thank you very much, Councillor Schwery. Councillor Hamilton. Thank you, Chair Kimson, and through you, um, one of the things I've been proud about to live in the city of Cambridge is that we've been very progressive and forward thinking when it comes to dealing with climate change. Uh, we passed a motion many years ago before I was even a councillor. I came here and delegated to speak in favor of uh, declaring climate change to be a crisis. We banned single-use plastics at City Hall, and only a few short months ago, we all passed a motion together, I believe it was unanimous, to look at mandating putting electric charging infrastructure in all new developments. This was, of course, recognizing the scale of the climatic crisis that we are confronting, not just today, but the exponentially expanding crisis that will face us two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. Um, Everything that the scientific evidence is pointing to is that we'll, it will hit us faster and harder than anything we have come to expect. The problem with climate change is that it is what is called a global collective action problem. That's where when the independent actions of different actors, everyone acts independently for their own gain, but together globally, it creates a catastrophe that no one's in control of. And here in the city, if we were to do something wrong, let's say we go park in the wrong spot, well, we have, you could say, a sovereign authority that's going to come tell us to move. We've got the police. We've got bylaw. When you've got a global collective action problem, there's no global sovereign that's going to come tell you what to do or right the ship. We're all on our own. So when it comes to climate change, one of the only mechanisms that has been deemed as effective is to incentivize the behavior of rational economic actors to do what is in their own self-interest, which in this case is to tax them. By providing an economic incentive for people to alter their behaviors, you actually can reduce the emission of carbon, you can facilitate the development of green infrastructure, and you start to ameliorate or reduce the scope of the problem. So it's been recognized by leading economists as the most effective tool we have right now, and that's across the political spectrum. You can go to the United States and you have economists like Alan Greenspan and Joseph Stiglitz coming together and saying, yes, the tax is the most effective mechanism to deal with this crisis because we have no other tools to do so. We don't have the authority to police it. March 26, there was a letter from Canadian economists regarding carbon pricing. Uh, leading professors from McGill, the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at U of T, Queens, Institutes for Research on Public Policy. What did they claim? claim? One is that carbon tax is working. In 2019, Canada's greenhouse gas emissions have fallen by almost 8%. And by 2030, it will result in almost half of Canada's emissions reductions. The second, and this is something I've heard frequently tonight, we all have to take seriously the affordability crisis that's hitting all of the residents in all of our constituencies and in our wards. But to claim that issues like housing costs and food insecurity are caused by the carbon tax is not, frankly, it's not just a stretch, it's beyond incorrect. And it's been debunked time and time again. Most recently was the Bank of Canada saying carbon pricing has caused less than one twentieth of Canada's inflation over the past two years. Why? Because we've had some major global events that have kind of knocked us off kilter, right? We've had a pandemic. We've had wars in the Ukraine. We have instability in the Middle East right now. We have massive supply chain issues that are raising costs everywhere. So the connection between rising inflation and food insecurity to the carbon tax is absolutely minimal at best. When it comes to the parliamentary budget officer, he is, as we know very well, a public servant. He was tasked at looking at what would this tax do at a certain point in time. He did find that, according to him, 80% of households would actually be better off at 2030. The 20% that wouldn't be would be the highest income earners, because that's who the tax would hit the hardest. They wouldn't get the rebates to the same extent that most of us would. But most importantly, and I'm wrapping up here, 
What the parliamentary bu budget officer did not quite connect on is that one, because he's only focusing on the task at hand, which is to look at the implementation of this tax, all of the net economic benefits that are accruing in the world are completely ignored and not factored into the, into the analysis. So the fact that 92% of global GDP is now produced by countries working to reach net zero, there is a tremendous amount of money and industry that's being created pursuing green technologies and instituting taxes like this. Why? Because it's a market-based innovation mechanism that drives change. And the second, this is most important, the PBO report doesn't count the cost of inaction. The report doesn't include, what's the cost of doing nothing? What if we stick our heads in the sand? Already today, Canadians are paying approximately $720 a year for climate change-related damages. It's estimated these costs will rise to about $2,000 a year by 2050, and it will be $25 billion in lost GDP by 2025. That's equal to half a year of growth. That's the cost of inaction. So again, we are a municipality. We don't control federal policy on anything. But at least what we can do is try and agree with the only mechanism that we know of to fight the worst, what scientists call super wicked problem in the history of our species. I think morally, morally, ethically, and scientifically, we have to support things like this, not just for us and the taxes we're paying today, but for the fact that our kids are gonna grow up in a world that right now will be absolutely unrecognizable to us. And that scares me a lot. And that's why I cannot come close to supporting a motion like this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Cooper. Yes, thank you, Chair Kimson. <clears throat> okay, where to start here? Um, this started off with some questioning of um, stats, stuff in the Parliamentary Budget Officer's report. Um, I'm going to bring out some, some stats here. Um, when it comes to this argument regarding the uh, the rebate, uh, the fact is there's not a province across uh, across Canada that where the the average middle class family will not lose out on this. Um, so I'll give you some numbers. Uh, cost to the average Ontarian family this year will be six hundred and twenty seven dollars. Year after that, because this goes up every year, and if everyone knows this is going to be implemented every year, it's going to be increased. Um, $627 this year, they will be out with the rebates. Next, the year after that, $799. Year after that, $987. Year after that, $1184. It goes on until the final year of this, 2030, 2031, where the average Ontarian family will be out by $1,820. More numbers. When you talk about the, uh, the effect that this is going to have on... Uh, on food and everything that we that we buy, there will be an effect because when you tax energy, you tax everything. Uh, what we're paying right now in gas, when you go to the pumps, we just had an increase, which means that seven, 17, almost 18 cents of your liter is uh, carbon tax. You after that, it'll be 21 cents. You go through the years until you get to 2030, when it will be 37 cents a liter will be carbon tax. Yes, this is adding to inflation, as stated by Bank of Canada Governor. 0.6% over its multi-year lifetime. We're doing this because they want to try and reduce emissions by 12%. Uh, so is this, let's say we do this, and this, what kind of effect this is going to have? I think the implication is if we do have a carbon tax, there's going to be some positive result to this. But what's that going to do? Well, the fact is, you can take Canada... You can wipe it off the map, completely gone, along with it, all our emissions. That will count to 1.5% of the emissions, global emissions. And we want to reduce just that, 1.5 by 12%. The fact is this carbon, whatever climate crisis you believe there is, is not going to be solved in Canada. It's just not, it's not possible. This is going to be solved in places like China, where they own 30% of carbon emissions. US, 15%. India, 7%. Many of these incredibly poor countries that simply don't care nearly to the level that we over here in the rich West care about. And they are not going to vol further volunteer to further their hardship in order to satisfy our rich country's desire for them to be more fuel efficient. 
The fact is, this isn't going to make a lick of difference to this climate crisis. And now, whether you believe the, the level of whether you think it's climate alarmism or not, whether whatever level of climate catastrophe you think is coming, or how much human-induced climate issue there is, one thing I could say for sure is that you're not going to fix it by taxing Canadian residents. It's just not possible. You can't fix a climate crisis by making people poorer today. It's true. Poor people won't be able to afford housing, food, gas, etc. Just, I mean, the basic concept that we're going to give rebates on gas. There's a lot of people that aren't, that assumes that people have the money to give away now and maybe get back later. That assumes they have money left over. A lot of them don't. If it takes now $100 to fill your car and you've only got 80, you're not filling it up. We're being told we can fix hypothetical suffering of the future by legislating guaranteed financial suffering today. I don't agree with that at all. I think people are suffering for this. I think the concept behind it is garbage. I think this is virtue signaling by our prime minister. I think it's pandering to their base. And I think the people of Ontario, people of Canada are suffering for it. And I just want to make a point that for anyone that wants to oppose this, which means they're supporting the carbon tax, just bear in mind for the people out there that when they are going out and they're going to be paying for their groceries, which yes, will be increased because of this. And when they go out to their pumps and they're seeing it at a dollar sixty-five, dollar seventy a litre or more, that when you oppose this and you support the carbon tax, you're supporting that. So just remember that. Thank you very I much. That's all I have to say on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Cooper. Um, I'd like to draw our attention to our um, procedural bylaws. Um, one that. 1.36 non-jurisdiction, meaning a matter that lies with another level of government and is outside the scope of council's powers as set out in section 11, uh, section 11 of the Municipal Act 2001, SO 2001, subsection 25. This includes matters that fall under regional, provincial, or federal responsibility or that lie with another municipality. So we've had quite a discussion this evening and I'd like to just circle back to the original motion that was put on the floor and ask that we can please um, go back to the motion and vote and call for the vote if we may please. Is that, is that okay with other councillors? Councillor Ameta, if I ask that you just keep it specifically to the motion at hand and not anything um, that was just mentioned that is outside of our jurisdiction. Thank you, uh, Chair Kimson, but we've always done motions like these as long as I've been on council. When did that change? Because I've supported a number of motions that are outside our jurisdiction. We passed them as resolutions. So when did that change? Through the chair as the clerk, I'm just going to state that your procedure bylaw that was adopted in November of 2022, um, sorry, May of 2023, um, and the section that was just read out by the chair, you you have a non-jurisdictional section in your procedure bylaw. This is a motion that does fall within non-jurisdictional. It is you know you're able to put the motion on the floor, but in terms of debating the merits of the motion and responsibilities that are within the motion, I would encourage council to do their best not to get into a debate around that. Saying we can't talk to this? I, um, thank you. I'm um, sorry, through you, Chair Kimson, I do appreciate that. I'm just a little bit confused how we can bring a motion forward and not be able to debate it. I'm just a little bit confused about that. I'm not like, trying to create trouble or anything, and maybe we need to revisit the procedural bylaw at some point in the future, but I'm a little bit confused. I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Calder would like to speak. 
Uh, thank you, Chair Kimson, and, and to Council. I think the point really is that you have a procedural bylaw with a non-jurisdictional item contained in that bylaw. I'm assuming by uh, the way the conversation is going that everybody around the table has basically waived that that uh, piece of your procedural bylaw by tax by having this conversation. So if you want to carry on, that's fine. I think we're just pointing out that you have a section in the bylaw that this would appear to be a non-jurisdictional item. And I think there's speeches being made about change that another level of government has the authority to make, not municipal government. So I think we're just cautioning that you're kind of cracking a door open here when you have, uh, I think, conversation like this that I think is a little bit beyond the scope of what we do here as a municipality. So then how does this apply to regional issues? Because the region of Waterloo does transit, for example. So should we be talking about LRT then? That's just a question that I have because it's not the Cambridge LRT, right? So how can we talk about that, but not this when that when the region is a different level of government? Well, if, if, if I may, Allison or Chair Kempson, that is a level of municipal government, which we are a party to in terms of the division of responsibilities between two municipal governments, which is different than us and provincial, us and federal. I'm not going to debate. I think we've pointed out a section of your procedural bylaw that I think you have basically said you're going to have this conversation. So that's fine, but we're just raising a concern that you could have other delegations coming to your podium talking about what I think your procedural bylaw classifies as non-jurisdictional. So be prepared to accommodate those conversations on different items of, of other levels of government that we have no control over. We have enough things to do as a municipality to take care of the business that we're responsible and accountable for without having to get into things of other government's jurisdiction. That's all we're saying. Thank you, Mr. Calder. Uh, Councillor Cooper? Make it quick. I, I appreciate what you're saying there. Um, I heard a lot in previous council about uh, oh, this is not our jurisdiction. This is not this is not that. We can't do anything about it. Um, but we do have voices, and we do have access to various different levels of um, officials, elected officials at different different levels. Uh, we can talk to them, and if this is of public interest, I do intend to use that voice. Um, we do regularly talk about stuff that's non-jurisdictional. Um, I do not appreciate being silenced or told we can't talk. I know you're not saying that now. We're having a good discussion about this. Um, but the uh, the alternative of us not discussing these things just because they happen to be at a different level, I feel that is a lot worse than um, than what we, you know, the idea we might spend a little time discussing something that is of public interest, may not be our jurisdiction, but is of interest, and they want us to use our voices to represent them. So that's all I have to say to that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. Do we have any more comments on the motion as presented by Councillor Ermetta? Thank you. Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call for the vote. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that motion fails at a, mo a vote of four to three. We have two notices of motion this evening. The first is by Councillor Schwery. It will be introduced tonight and discussed at the April 30th, 2024 council meeting. Councillor Schwery, please read your motion aloud. Thank you, Chair Kimson. Move my, myself, seconded by Councillor Devine. 
whereas the current water billing model for the city of Cambridge requires the landlord owner of the property to pay unpaid water sewage bills. And whereas council approved the landlord and tenant water account in February of 2015, and whereas the tenant should be responsible for their water and sewage usage. Now, therefore, be it resolved that council directs staff to report back by July 2024 on changing the current landlord and tenant water account to require tenants to be financially responsible as the end user for the unpaid water and sewage bills. Thank you very much, Councillor Schwery. The second notice of motion is by Councillor Earnshaw. It will be introduced tonight and discussed at the April 23rd, 2024 Councillor Council meeting. Councillor Earnshaw, please read your motion aloud. Thank you, Chair Kimson. It's moved by me and seconded by you, uh, Councillor Kimson, that staff be directed to conduct a comprehensive inventory of city realty assets that are at present leased to, licensed for occupation by, or otherwise occupied by third parties, and submit a report to Council by or before the end of 2024. And further, that staff simultaneously with submission of the report propose for consideration by Council a draft leasing and licensing policy for rental, occupation of city realty assets by third party tenants, licensees, and occupiers. Thank you very much, Councillor Earnshaw. Moving on to other business. Does any member of council have any other business they wish to discuss? Councillor Schwery, you have other business that you wish to bring forward? Thank you, Council um, Chair Kimson. Given the recent interest on Fountain Street, King and Shawns Hill, and in light of the traffic concerns in the area, while we are aware that staff are currently working on a proposed secondary plan for the area around Fountain Street, I would like to provide some direction for staff and ask, and that I ask be included in the minutes of our meeting today, that staff be directed to report back with an analysis of a planning rationale, including study area for an interim control bylaw within the Preston area and provide a draft interim control bylaw for council's consideration. Thank you, Councillor Schwery. Is there any other business? Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chair Kimson. Um, I just wanted to recognize that this week is National Volunteer Week. And uh, I had the pleasure of attending an event last night um, regarding Waterloo, um, the Waterloo Volunteer Organization. And they do incredible work here. And they were speaking just to sort of the, the economic impact of volunteerism and um, the amount of money and the number of FTEs that we would have to have to fill those roles is massive. The numbers are, are huge. And so I just wanted to um, say a special thank you to anyone who volunteers in our community. Um, you know, uh, our fire chief was here earlier and he said that our, our firefighters had volunteered over 1600 hours this year uh, or last year, which was pretty incredible. So thank you to anyone who spends um, their time volunteering our community. It's certainly the backbone of many of our social service agencies and definitely we couldn't function without you. So thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Roberts, for bringing that to our attention. And certainly there's many volunteers in our community who do a lot that goes unnoticed. So if you do happen to have the opportunity to thank a volunteer, or if you are one yourself, please accept our thanks. Our next order of business is the motion to receive. Councillor Schwerer, you have the motion. Please read it in its entirety. Oh, yes. Thank you, Chair um, Kimson. I move by myself, seconded by Councillor Armada, that all presentation and correspondence from April 16, 2024, Council meeting be received. Thank you very much, Councillor Schwery. I'll ask the clerk to call for the vote. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that carries unanimously. 
Our next order of business is the consideration of bylaws. Councillor Hamilton, you have the motion. Could you please read it in its entirety? Thank you, Chair Kempson. Through you, it's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Meta. Recommendation that the following bylaws listed under the heading of introduction and consideration of bylaws be enacted and passed. 24-033 being a bylaw to adopt amendment number 77 of the City of Cambridge official plan 2012 as amended with respect to land municipally known as 102 Fountain Street South, 199 Abraham Street, 134 Fountain Street North, and 144 Fountain Street North. 24-034 being a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw 150-85 as amended with respect to land municipally known as 102 Fountain Street South, 199 Abraham Street, 134 Fountain Street North, and 144 Fountain Street North. 24-035 being a bylaw of the Corporation of the City of Cambridge to exempt certain lots or blocks pursuant to subsection 50 bracket 5 of the Planning Act, RSO 1990, I always forget how to read this, but I'll say C.P.13 as amended, part lot control exemption, part of block 191 on registered plan 58M-684, 24-036 being a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw number 15085 as amended with respect to land municipally known as 84 Chalmers Street North. Thank you very much, Councillor Hamilton. I'll ask the clerk to call for the vote. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that carries unanimously. Our next order of business is the confirmatory bylaw. Councillor Roberts, you have the motion. Can you please read it in its entirety? Yes, thank you. Chair Kimson, uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Cooper. Recommendation that bylaw 24-037, being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Cambridge, be passed. Thank you very much, Councillor Roberts. I'll ask the clerk to call for the vote. Starting voting. And closing voting. And that carries unanimously. Councillor Cooper? Yep. Did I miss something? I didn't hear them calling. <laughs> Okay, we all want to get here. We go. We reached the end of our agenda. The final order of business is the closing of the meeting. Councillor Cooper, you have the motion. Could you please read it in its entirety? I knew it. Um, okay, so the adjournment, we can all go home. Moved by me, seconded by Councillor Earnshaw, that the council meeting does now adjourn at 10 04 p.m. I'll ask the clerk to call for the vote. Starting voting. And closing voting and that carries unanimously thank you everybody for joining us tonight and a special thanks for everyone's patience tonight while i was in this position and we all worked through it together so i wish everyone a good evening and have a great day